Hey, tribe of journeymen and women. Wouldn't you say that quarantine makes you look like a badass ninja? I think it does. But obviously, let's not use it here because I found a quiet, peaceful spot where uh, no one else should be coming down. This is kind of this weird uh, wooden bench in Vilnius, capital of Lithuania. And uh, today I wanted to sit down with you and talk about something very special. It's actually a uh, it's actually a, a story that I haven't yet uh, recorded anywhere publicly, and it kind of dawned on me this morning when I actually woke up in like at 6 a.m. in the morning. Obviously, not ready to get up from bed yet, but but this thought started you know, kind of sticking with me, and I realized, damn, it's an important story that needs to be told, and I never actually told it. I guess. I'm not even sure why. Uh, the story is actually about my first Aikido instructor, whom I rarely talk about. Uh, I guess I mainly focus on my main Aikido instructor, with whom I learned with in Switzerland. And uh, I only studied for four years with my first instructor back in Lithuania, in my hometown, Panevejis. But at the same time, it was a really significant experience you know that guy he helped me get started on the path of Aikido but also to be honest that's the person who showed me the exposed me to the dark side of Aikido I, I understood that only later but now that I think back he's a, kind of you could say a great representation of the bad things that Aikido does or could do to you if you mishandle it and it's one thing it's it's an easy martial art to mishandle so Today we're going to look all about that. We have coffee to take away. Let's have a sip and let's get started on this subject. So, uh, the initial part of the story is that I was 14 when I started training with him. I kind of just turned 14 and uh, I was always into uh, the whole Japanese culture, Eastern Asian culture. And I always wanted kind of, you know, I was interested in the Bushido, the, the, the samurai code of you know, loyalty and braveness and kind of the samurai conduct value system. And I, I always wanted to kind of be a samurai. And I think, you know, when you're 14, it's a very impressionate age when it's easy to make an impression on you. And uh, despite the fact that I was always into martial arts, I was... I never really trained one until I, I kind of trained at home. My father was always physically active, so I would copy him and kind of train with him at home, but not martial arts. I would do my own make-believe martial arts at home sometimes, play samurai. Uh, but only when my friend invited me to try out Aikido together with him, I went to the first class ever. I didn't know much about Aikido whatsoever. Uh, but the very first time I saw it, it was just like, whoa, it was like, it dawned on me, like, that's exactly what I'm searching for. Like, you know, there's the Hakama and there's the samurai swords and wooden swords, but still there's the whole samurai culture and the movement and the flow of Aikido just kind of really struck me like, this is exactly what I want. And then the more I dug into Aikido, the more I learned about it. I was reading The Art of Peace. It's, it's kind of an interesting and actually a nice book by the founder of Aikido, Morhi Shiba who actually that book is also shown in Walking Dead if you ever watch that TV show famous TV show there's an episode where a guy learns Aikido and he, he's given to read an Aikido book and that's the art of peace those are a bunch of quotes from the founder and some of them are really nice ideas and the translation was in my native tongue where it was kind of a bit peculiar now that I look back it was definitely heavily influenced by the person who translated it but at the moment it really resonate with me because it was spoken a lot about peace and kind of creating impact on other human beings and serving others and being in harmony with everything else and the more I read about it the more I felt like oh my god this is exactly the martial art I need and especially because I, I like to say that once in a while that I used to be a peaceful kid I never liked violence uh, but I, I was living in a rough city where my friends would get attacked a lot of times and I would be in danger myself often. And uh, I, but I never wanted to kind of hit someone or, or hurt them. Like, I always kind of felt this compassion towards others and, and 
empathy and I didn't want to hurt other people, but obviously I didn't want to get hurt either or I didn't want my friends to get hurt. And Aikido officially states that it's, it's all just a defensive martial art. It's all about defense. It's not about attacking. And that is kind of about protecting yourself without harming others. Now that I look back, it's a long story short, but I don't think that's true. It's not really possible with the way Aikido is trained. But that, was, that idea was presented to me, and, uh, and I obviously believed it. You know, I thought it's true, especially because, and that's kind of the, one of the main points I'm, I'm heading on to here, is I was in that impressionate age, and uh, my Aikido instructor, he was, uh, he's actually my dad's age, uh, because they used to be classmates for a couple of years. Uh, but so he, um, uh, he, he was older, like around 50, I guess, 45, 50. And he, he kind of had that stature of a sensei, you know, he had this straight posture and he was well built, he was quite athletic and, and he had this kind of face and eyes where it looks like he looked like a wise person and he kind of acted like one too, which, you know, is good and bad. Uh, but but, uh, you know, he, the way he spoke and things he spoke, he kind of acted like, acted like a wise person. And that really got to me. I was like, oh, this, you know, this guy is something beyond. I really trusted him. And, and I was always like, I used to always be a very good student. And I was always the guy who would really focus on learning as best as I can. I was a very loyal student. So whatever he would tell me, I would believe him. And I would... You know, try to do my best to fulfill whatever tasks he would give me. Now that I look back, I, I realize that's one of the first mistakes. That's one of the first bad things that happened because I would blindly follow him and I would not question him. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I was just 14. And I trained with him like for four years until I left for Switzerland. But um, the thing is, at that age, you know, critical thinking is not common in general yet alone in that age. And again, as I mentioned, you're very impressionate in that age. And I think now that I look at being an instructor or a teacher, I, I recognize it's so important to educate your students about the importance of critical thinking, to tell them, look, I'm not an almighty God being. I am a faulty person myself. I make my mistakes. Don't believe everything I say. I do my best, but I'm not perfect and to kind of educate your students that they would be realistic about what you're giving them and that they would be critical about that, that they wouldn't take everything for, you know, for a real thing. The dark side to my relationship with my first Aikido instructor was that that was not encouraged. You were more or less encouraged, not in a direct way, but, but the way the dojo, the school was built and the way he would teach, he would present everything as absolutes. You know, he would present things as, that is the truth. And uh, that's already a bad thing to do. That's kind of a, the lack of recognition of your own lack of, uh, your own lack of knowledge or skill. And, and, and if you don't recognize what you're missing, if you don't know what you don't know, one of my favorite quotes these days, and then you are passing along knowledge, you will obviously pass on a lot of bad things. And so to come back to that whole story and, and how it started to roll, so I went to the first class, I really liked it. I read about Aikido the, and the more I read about it, the more I became devoted to it. And uh, the interesting part with this, that particular school of Aikido that, that I used to attend, my first Aikido school, I, I used to kind of joke that it was cursed because, uh, but that was so, now I think that was because of two reasons, but back then I could recognize only one. Uh, so one thing, the, the kind of more universal thing was that that city, it, it's the fifth biggest city of Lithuania, but then whenever people would finish going, uh, finish their high school, they would usually leave to go to university somewhere else. So that was one of the reasons why my Aikido instructor never had, you know, long-term students who would reach their black belts. And he was not a black belt himself at that day. Uh, long story why again, but he wasn't. 
and uh, although he trained for years and years. Uh, if you're very interested why part of it was political, part of it I think again it's due to his character, that's a long story. But coming back to the curse, so, so he would have either adult students who were just you know doing it for leisure, so they never really progressed very far, or he would have young guys like myself, enthusiastic, but then we would hit the time for school and we would leave and that was it. So it was kind of this kind of a limbo state. But now I also recognize there were other faults too. And one of the parts was that um, he was he was very much holding us back for a reason I could kind of understand, but but I don't think it was a healthy reason. And it's one of the things I don't want to go too deep into today, but but I'll just give you a general layout. So um, he he would really want us to become perfect before we move on to the next exam. And he was not examining us ourselves uh, himself. You know, he didn't have the permission. He he had to go he had to go to his Aikido instructor in a different city, and then we would pass exams like once in six months or a year. And so when the other schools would um, get their grades much faster, we would take a long time to perfect our current rank. We would work, we would work really hard on the same stuff again and again and again and again until he would approve and say, okay, you're ready to pass your exam. And then we would go and do it, but that would take forever. And so the progression would be really slow, which I think is, wasn't healthy because the thing is now if you dissect and break down the the things I feel like the bad things, the bad messages, the bad lessons I took from that school or that teaching style, that teaching method was that first of all we were given the impression that it's possible to be perfect you know, that you should always aim for perfection which I think is a generally a flawed way to go and I'm planning to make a whole video about that. I think that you have to realize that no one is perfect, you'll never be perfect, and, and that kind of makes you a bit more loose, and then you tr do things, and you experiment, and you motivate yourself to keep going, and then you just gradually become much better. But it's not about being perfect, but in that school, we were kind of being demanded to be perfect. And that's crazy, you know, because that's that's already putting on demands and an unhe unhealthy perspective. And, and that would kind of breed a bit of competition in me against my friends, you know, wanting to be better or, or always demanding more from myself, always pushing myself harder. And that's kind of, you can see there's a good side to it, but also there's a bad side to it because you would become over demanding and I would burn myself out. And that's one of the next parts I'll come to. You would eventually burn yourself out bad. But uh, again, coming back to that curse. So that was again, kind of a cursey thing, but, but I think also too, to be honest, and you know, we could say like, that's my personal opinion, but that I, I base it quite on strong arguments. I also think the younger students, when they would become more mature, they would start to see that there's something off about the teaching method. There's something off about the way our teacher was handling us as a group, especially the young kids. You know, kind of that, a bit of a cultish feeling, I guess, but I'll get into that in more detail. But I think with maturity, uh, because I would meet his older students who, who you know, graduated, uh, kind of left the city because of university and I would meet them and they would all kind of be acting a bit weird they were all a bit uncertain about their memories about that school and I'd be like oh you know come back down because I was so enthusiastic I was so pumped about that school and about Aikido and the way he taught that I would always be like oh come back you know let's train and I want to learn from you and they would always be like ah you know maybe maybe not today and you know they were kind of holding back and I wasn't sure at the day like what what was it and then I realized because I, my realization now is because they grew to mature and realized that there was, again, something off about that whole thing and they weren't so enthusiastic to come back to it now with a more mature mind. So to kind of get you a better, give you a better understanding of what that was and, and what difficulties I went through and what I learned through them, coming back to the initial stages of my story. so. I became a very loyal student and I would train all the time and I really wanted to excel, I really wanted to learn as fast as I can and I was again very devoted and so I asked my teacher to let me train not only with the, with the kids group which was until 18 but also with the adults and he gave me the permission so I would train like 
two times per day. Then eventually I also asked him to let me join the kids class. And so I would be there all the time. I was training all the time, kids, teens, uh, adults, and I was fully immersed. And then that naturally kind of led us to develop a relationship, like a close relationship with my Aikido instructor. We would, he started to invite me to his place, which was, you know, just such a, such a cool thing for me. I felt, you know, so special to, to get a chance to get, hang out with him. And, and I was just swallowing everything he was saying. Like I was really like, you know, listening with my eyes open, eyes and ears open, like to whatever he said. And I was listening with, with you know, super focus, trying to remember everything, trying to kind of take in his wisdom. And so he would invite me to his place and we would have tea. And sometimes we would just go for hours and hours talking. Well, actually, you know, now that I look back, it was him talking. I was barely talking, you know, I was just listening and listening and sometimes maybe asking questions. And so we became really close and he actually, I was like 16, but I think because of that curse that he would be losing students all the time, he never had advanced students. Uh, he started to ask me to cover him for initially for teaching kids and then even to cover teaching adults, which was great experience for me because I wanted to be an Aikido instructor. Uh, I, I was developing that hunger for it and that was a great experience for me, you know, it was crazy. I was a 16 year old guy teaching adults or being responsible for like a group of 15 kids. But, but it was a valuable experience for me because, you know, I was exposed to it and I could practice my skills of being a teacher. I think that helped me in the future. Although it's a bit crazy, I'm not sure if, you know, that's, that was a correct thing to do given now, now looking back at it more rationally. Well, nevertheless, I appreciate that, that opportunity. But now, to kind of look at the dark side of those things, because there's def there's, there were, definitely was one, uh, I think the main flaw with the whole school and with the whole method of how he was conducting that the group was, now that I look back, there was a huge... Uh, there, were, there was a huge lack of critical thinking. Not only, you know, critical thinking encouraging us, but also he was, as much as I, you know, hate saying that, as much as I'm sorry to say that, but, but I have to admit, he had a huge lack of ability to have critical thinking. You know, he was believing in the esoterics, in the mystical. And the reason, I think that's one of the reasons why, also my relationship with my main Aikido instructor, the one I, I you know, took on later, my bad experience with him combined with my first experience with my first instructor, I think that's what makes me feel so strong and heavy about wanting to talk about this and wanting to bring up the subject of how important a student and teacher relationship is and how dangerous it can be if it's, if it's um, conducted in a bad way. And yeah, so, so when there was a lack of critical in in him, I don't know if he understood that or not, you know, how impactful he was to us, especially the young guys, you know, the, the open minds, especially such as myself, who was not questioning him at all. I was trusting and believing whatever he said, like, you know, religiously. And the thing is, the things he said, oftentimes were, you know, they were silly or they were just off. Like, I'll give you a few examples so you would know what I'm talking about. So for example, he... There's one thing I actually, it's, it's as crazy as it is, I am, you could say, still fighting that till this day. I'm 30 now. And I was hanging out with him between 14 and 17, I guess, 18 years old, year old. And uh, in the early stages of our relationship, he told me that he read, and, and that was the thing. He would sometimes read something and he would instantly believe it and tell us that as truth. He would be like, he wouldn't be like, oh, I read this and this sounds interesting and let's look at this. He's, he's like, he read it and he's like, oh, you know what? Now I know that this is like that. And so to give that example is he read that you have to put your tongue at the top of your mouth. Like you have to, you know, kind of attach it. That then your chi or chi travels better. It's a full circle. And if you don't do it, your, your, your chi is not as powerful. And you know, at that day, because partly because I was a kid, you know, watching Dragon Ball Z and wanting to save the world, but part of it because he was putting faith in stuff like that. 
uh, I, um, you know, I, I really want it. Sorry, I'll just fix the mic a bit. You know, I really wanted to attain all of that, all of those superpowers, and uh, it was all that cheese stuff and whatnot was super, was super important for me. And uh, when he would say a thing like that, I, I would, I would take it, you know, with a hundred percent conviction. And so when I heard that specifically, and trust me, there were so many things like that, but I'll give you that specific example. When I, when I heard him say that, every day, every single moment of my day, I started to put my tongue at the top of my mouth and hold it there. Initially, it was a struggle, you know, initially it took effort to do it, but I kept doing it again and again all the time until it became such a strong habit that I did it all the time. Every moment I would catch myself, I'm, I'm always, I always have my tongue at the top. And, and that later, years later, I started to realize that's not very good for me because, you know, my tongue is, there's tension in the mouth, you know, it's like, it's an extra effort, at least I, I think it is. And it just does make sense when you look at it rationally, the whole thing. But even until today, I sometimes catch myself having my tongue at the top of the mouth and I have to force myself to let go of, release the, the tongue, kind of loosen up my jaw. It's mental, it's bizarre, it's crazy that it is, but it still is. I have to fight it and I'm trying to reprogram myself. It's so heavily programmed in me and I have to refight myself not to do it. And there were a lot of things like that. He was very precise and very strict about certain things. Like one time he read that you have to put your, when you're in Seiza, which is a traditional Japanese way of sitting on your knees, that's how we would do our meditation. And he would tell us that, he read once that, and he would tell us that as the truth, that you would have, you have to put your right toe on, your, on the top of your left toe, because that's kind of, that delivers better the masculine energy or something like that. And, and you know, I would suddenly do that thing. And there were so many things again like that. And he had so many beliefs, like strong beliefs that he would tell us as truth. And I think that that would further develop my lack of critical thinking. And, and no, maybe some of you who are douchebags, you know, you could listen to this and be like, oh, Rokas, it's your fault because, you know, you listened to him and you didn't question him. And, you, you know, it's your fault that you believed in him. Fuck you, man. <laughs> or woman. Whoever you are. That's such an unfair thing to say. And I kind of laid it out already, but you can't, you can't expect a child of that age without specific education to, to be qualified to have such a bullshit detector, you know, it's unfair. That's why it's so important for any teacher who works with, with adults too, but even especially children to be mindful of that and to be humble and to really pressure test and really double check his sources of knowledge, what he's giving to students, because I, trust me, there's a lot of kids like me, maybe not as devoted as I was, but there, there are, you know, kids take things. You just something, you just throw something out there without thinking about it much, but, but some kid will hear you and he will take it to heart and he will, you know, really believe it and really practice it. And, even if you didn't intend it to. And you have to be careful about that. You have to educate the people who you work with, especially if you're the authority figure. Because the authority figure, that's how our society works. We are, we are taught to believe in authorities. So it's a double-way relationship, but especially if we're talking about kids and adults, it's 80% adults' responsibility. And if you don't agree with me, then you know, turn the city off and, and go live in your fantasy. Now let's continue. So some of the worst things that happened too during that period was, and probably the worst thing, which which kind of started to develop my resentment to Aikido already in that stage, or at least it enforced or strengthened my my resentment to Aikido. Like if you you followed my martial arts journey, you know that for a while I was really heavy against Aikido. Like I was really like negative about it, trying to say to people like, look, this doesn't work, this is dangerous and so on. And part of it was because I remembered those days and how I was, how I was, how I was fooled, how I was strict, and how dangerous it was. Uh, to jump a little bit to the future where I was with my 
next Aikido instructor, I thought he had things to f figure. He had things figured out, and I believed him again. My mistake, I guess. But I thought for a while that okay, okay, he's not doing the same mistake my first instructor did. But I realized he did, just on a more subtle level, and that's why it became even more frustrating. You know, I saw that it's all over the place. It's all all over the world. It's it's not a one-time thing, which again made me more negative. But then coming back to the first scenario, to my first instructor, um, you know, I, I mentioned in the in the first stages of this talk, his kind of quest for perfection. And this this was the part which, again, as I said, was really frustrating for me because he he was very very specific about how the aikido techniques had to be done. There was zero freedom about it. Even if we did freestyle Aikido, like if, you know, Randori, like people would attack you, you would still have to do it exactly the way the instructor was telling us to do. And so it was like, grab this, grab like this, not like this. If you have a bit of an angle wrong, it's wrong. It doesn't work, which is crazy because first of all, if you look at martial arts, a real life attack is chaotic. It will never be exactly like that. So to demand the person to do it exactly that way is crazy. But if you're not into martial arts, because, you know, I'm, I, I want this to be a valuable lesson for everyone. If you're not into martial arts, do realize this applies to everything else, especially like to yoga. I went through the same with yoga. When somebody tells you, you need to do this exactly right like this. And I, I kind of ranted about this in my Why Yoga Sucks episode, where I said that, you know, you don't know specifically what injuries that person has and you can't say like if something works for you it doesn't mean it's going to work for another person you can't force him to do it the way you do it and eventually that started to make, make me frustrated in regards to you know the the aikido school because my aikido instructor was demanding me to do it that way and um and it was it was basically the way he did it you know and I was much taller than him, I was leaner than him, I had a very different build, and I had to force myself to re do it exactly like him. So it's, it's just mental, it's just crazy. Uh, which again kind of made me more, 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 you know, stuck in a way thinking that there's only one way to do things, which is, maybe it's not, you know, the worst belief to have or embody, but, but it's still not a good mindset. And that was being taught, but, but that, what kind of, what, that kind of led to as well well the dangerous side of it especially in, in the terms of martial arts um, I mentioned to you that you know the city I was living in it was a dangerous place I would be facing a dangerous situation of a potential attack pretty much daily like you could get mugged in the middle of the city center during day bright day that would happen that happened like not I, luckily I was always able to avoid an actual mugging but I had to defend myself multiple, multiple times and I had my friends mugged in front of me during day in the city center so it was a dangerous place to be so being attacked was very possible but then uh, I was being taught by my kid instructor there's a, that there's only one way to do the things there's only one right, right way which is right his way and if you're attacked, even if you're attacked, you need to do it specifically like that. And there were multiple times when I was actually attacked and I was stuck in that mindset of, oh, crap, you have to do it specifically like that. And there's one story which I did share when I was jumped by five guys and they wanted to mug me. And I freaked out and I didn't know what to do in that situation because nobody grabbed me. Actually, actually, funny enough, one guy grabbed me on the collar, but I didn't train techniques like what happens, like what do you do if you're grabbed by the collar? I freaked out. I don't, I'm like, I don't know a technique from this position. I just hit him with my fist. They pepper spray me, pepper spray me then, and I ran away. And actually, 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 I was also, I stood there standing because I was taught. My Aikido instructor never taught me that running away is a good option. And, uh, and so I stood there. You know, five guys jumped me. I hit one. They freak out. They didn't expect me to fight back. And instead of running and taking that opportunity as they're freaking out, which would be the smart decision, I stood there in my Aikido stance, looking if they have knives, pretending to defend myself against four guys. Because of, let's be honest, because of bad teaching. That's how my instructor taught me. 
again, then these pepper sneed me, then I ran away, so thank goodness I made it safe. But the thing is, including that situation and some others, uh, that when I was jumped and I was attacked and I had to defend myself, you know, I would always talk with my Aikido instructor about that afterwards. I would tell him, look, I was jumped, I didn't know what to do. And guess what his response was? Now, not in the same blunt words, but basically his message was, it was your fault. It was your fault that you were not able to defend yourself. You want to guess why? Because you did not train enough. You did not train well enough. Crazy, huh? Can you believe it? That was the, the vibe of the school. That was his teaching method. Every time I was jumped, and there were quite a few times, and I was not able to defend with the stuff he taught me, he never thought, maybe the stuff I'm teaching is shit. Maybe I should change something. He would blame me, I'm sure, I'm sure others. He would tell us, he would tell me, well, you should train more. Or next time, if, if the guy grabs you like this, you should do this technique. And now that I look back, I think that's kind of one of the dark things I, I did want to address and did want to point out. Is that through that period, I was in, in deep fear. I was in constant fear. It's kind of almost actually something I almost forgot. And obviously it was enough that I was living in an environment which was dangerous all the time. But not enough with that, my Aikido did not give me any confidence. I always was, whenever I would be walking and seeing someone, some potential threat, and that was common, you would see three guys walking your way and you would know that probably they will attack you. It was a huge chance. So I was, all, I was always scanning my environment and I was always you know, being prepared to defend myself. And... Um, And yeah, and, uh, and, and the thing I would do, I would imagine, okay, they're going to attack me. If they grab me like this, I'm going to defend like this. If they grab me like this, I'm going to defend like this. If they grab me like this, I'm going to defend like this. And it's like, oh, but if, what if, if they're going to grab me like this? And I would start to freak out because I wouldn't know all the answers. Because I was taught that that's the way you defend yourself. That's the way of Aikido. And I would always blame myself for being afraid and for not knowing the, the technique enough. And, and, and I, the thing I would do afterwards, I would just train more of the same shit. And now that when you dissect it and when you look at it, I don't like to blame people. You know, If you know part of my philosophy is taking your own responsibility, but it's difficult not to, you know, it's difficult not to, see that that was the conditioning that I was in. You know, I, I came to conclusion, I, I, I blame myself, and I came to conclusion that, you know, that I was a coward, that it was my fault that I don't know enough Aikido, or that I'm just a, a scary, scary, you know, scary pants, you know, a cowardized person. And my Aikido instructor, well, I guess, you know, he didn't know what he didn't know. and I can't expect him to know everything. And I wish he would have told me that fear is natural. That it's, it's okay to be afraid. Everybody's afraid. Even the best fighters in the world are afraid. If you're not afraid, you're stupid. That fear is not a bad sign. It's what you do with that fear that matters. That it's normal to be afraid, that it doesn't mean you're a coward. I wish he would have told me that it was his mistake that he didn't really taught me real self-defense. He didn't question that. He didn't question himself. He just blamed me. He, he just blamed us. And that fear stuck with me for a long time. And I was conditioned by the difficult environment that I was around me, of always being uh, you know, jumped on. But a lot of it was just stress that I don't know what the fuck to do in it. My second Aikido instructor didn't help me much either. I developed false confidence with him. Only when I started training mixed martial arts and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. 
I started developing real confidence and real understanding that what a physical conflict is. And then I realized that that, you know, I'm not an ultimate human being, but also know how to fight. And now I'm more aware, more cautious, more humble, but also more prepared. I'm not afraid anymore. You know, if there's some douchebag, you know, who would be attacking a lady on the street, per se, and I would feel the responsibility to step in and, and protect her, it doesn't mean I wouldn't have adrenaline, which most people confuse with fear, but I would go in there because I would know that, you know, I would risk my life, it would be dangerous, but I would know that I know what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to dealing with real conflict, you know, with people who want to choke you out or punch you, punch you, like seriously. But back then I couldn't because of the, you know, terrible education. Now, again, you could look at the story and especially if you're a deeply devoted religious Aikido person, you know, could look at the story and again say, blame the, the particular school or teacher. And be like, oh, you're, Rokas, you're unlucky, you met a really bad teacher. And yeah, I do think he wasn't that great. But you also need to understand that there's a huge chance that there are plenty of instructors like him, exactly like him, or at least, you know, lesser versions of him. But that direction, I realize that's, that's common in a culture where questioning is not encouraged. And in Aikido, unfortunately, as much as in some yoga school, spirituality, which I'm all about talking about the shit that it delivers and gets people into, it's, it comes a lot of it comes from the lack of critical thinking. It's a culture, it's a hi hierarchical culture where the instructor is enforced to feel like he knows it all. He's not tested, he's not pressure tested, he's not questioned. And that culture leads to a bad teacher, and a bad teacher leads to bad outcomes for students. And I think that's one of the main messages here for me in this video. And yeah, there were a lot of other things. You know, and like like I do I am quite upset about my kid instructor, but I think there's probably just one more thing which I will share on the video to make sure that hopefully if you're working through the same, if you're exposed to the same thing, you will be able to see through it earlier than I did, and you wouldn't blame yourself. You would understand that this is not a healthy way to conduct a group. This is bad behavior, it enforces bad habits, and you shouldn't you know, put the blames on you. You should, you should realize that it's not you, it's the culture that you're in, and now it's your responsibility to get the hell out of that culture, to find a culture which, do, which breeds confidence, which breeds humil humility, and realistic, uh, understanding, uh, realistic assessment of your abilities. Yeah, but so I think the last part that I want to share with you is uh, I think eventually I started to kind of feel down about learning Aikido with him because, uh, you know, I would train so much. I would train, pretty much I would go to the, to the dojo, I would have the keys and I would train with my friends every day and I would do so much but I would never be acknowledged by my Aikido instructor. He would always be like, well, Rokas, you're still doing this wrong and it's not good enough and you should work harder. Your technique is not that good. But also it didn't work when I was jumped, when I was attacked. So I was starting, to, I lost confidence. I lost it more and more. And I started questioning that maybe my Aikido instructor is not, they're sending off with him. Maybe it's just not me. And it was a really difficult thing to do because, you know, he was my father figure. He was like a father figure to me and, and I respected him so much. So it was such a difficult thing to question and ask, maybe he's wrong. It was a painful process. But I started doing that and it was more difficult and more difficult to connect with him. I started seeking answers outside of it, outside of that place. Uh, but also still wanted to be an Aikido instructor. And uh, it was crazy because he, he had one quality which I feel is a quality that should be avoided by all means. And again, it's something I'm hesitant to talk about because I don't want to you know make it too personal. But you know, if I, if I, at the same time, if I will keep my mouth shut and, you know, I will let it slip, it's like that phrase, that famous phrase, which I think Einstein said, or it's kind of a well-known phrase, that 
if good people will it's kind of like that I can't say it exactly but it's like if good people won't do anything about the bad things if there if the few people if the few good people won't do something about the bad things that are happening then you know the world will be lost now it's sometimes difficult to talk about certain things but but sometimes it's important to so uh, a quality which I feel was unhealthy was that my first Aikido instructor he would I kind of mentioned that in the beginning he would always feel like he knows the answer and he was very quick to tell that everyone else doesn't unless it was people he approved you know so it was like his, his Aikido instructor or or some Aikido instructor from especially from Japan he was at all about Japanese, and I think that's kind of a recurring bad, bad pattern where, where yoga people think that only Indians can learn yoga, where Japanese, where martial artists think that only Japanese know real Aikido, and etc. He was like that. Like if it was a, if it was a Japanese person, he was like that means he knows the answer. He was worshiping them. But if it was someone, especially a Westerner, who he did not know, he was quick to judge and say it's bullshit. You know, he's a heretic. He's fake. He was very strong about it, and. Uh, I, um, when I decided that I will move to Switzerland and become an Aikido instructor, I thought he would be proud of me. Because, you know, I'm like, my God, it's a big step. You know, I'm, I, the, the path that he led me onto, he, um, he, I, I, I thought about taking it on professionally. I thought he will be proud. I went to a legit high ranking Aikido instructor and, and soon enough, he decided he's fake, you know, without ever meeting him, just seeing like a couple videos. And he was upset about me. And he was like, well, Rokas, you shouldn't go there. You know, that guy's a fake. You should stay with me and train, continue to train. That was his you know, suggestion. Train with me and you will know real Aikido, which is such an arrogant thing to say. Again, such a lack of critical thinking. And then I moved to Switzerland and ever since then, he resented me. He never accepted me back. I you know I, I gained my ranks, I gained a second black belt, I would come and visit him sometimes and, and he would always give me a hard time. He would always be like, well, you know, you're Aikido shit, basically. It was tough, it was hard, you know, because part of me wanted approval from him. And it was painful for, to, for me to be considered by him to be fake. But that's how he was. And I think, again, it's, it's an unhealthy way. You know, you should, a student, a teacher's quality should be the desire for your students to outgrow you. That should be celebrated. And I didn't feel like that was you know, the case. So it was kind of a weird direction. And, and to this day, actually only like about six months ago, maybe even less, to be honest. I think it's just like a few months ago. I think it was January this year. Because I, we, we haven't seen each other for a couple of years like live, but, but he would be on Facebook. And he would come to my Facebook page, not, on, not private messages, but he would come on my Facebook page and, and he would give me, like, shit. He would write me, like, really heavy criticisms, critical messages. Like, if I would release the video, and he wouldn't... The, the funny part is that he doesn't even understand English. But he would watch some of my videos and, and he would see me training MMA and he was very judgmental about that. He would judge me as, as along a few other people, that, you know, that I'm a brute, that I'm some violent brute and... And I failed Aikido, and I never learned real Aikido, and I never really understood Aikido. Like he would write public messages, which everyone could see like that. He would criticize me, and he would be like, Rokas, you have no clue what you're talking about. You're a lost soul, and you're trying to help others, but actually you're just fooling everyone else. He would literally stu write stuff like that. And again, it was a bit heavy for me to, to read that, because at a certain time I respected him. And I was honoring him and I believed in him. And I was taking him as an example. And then he, he, it was, you know, part of me wanted to consider that maybe what he's saying is true, but it was so off, which made it even more painful. And eventually, eventually I just blocked him on Facebook. And that made my day. You know, I, I tried to reason with him. I tried to respond and said, look, you know, like, let's be humble, you know, and maybe you don't know what you're talking about, you know. Why don't you listen in more and try to understand what I'm talking about? You know, I'm, I don't. I think you're not seeing the whole picture. But he was, no, he thought he was convinced he's right and I'm wrong. And he was publicly giving me shit about it. 
Yeah, so uh, that was tough, but uh, that's one of the superpowers I learned is blocking people. <laughs> Sometimes, like, you know, we... Most of the times we don't want to do it because we feel like, you know, that makes us weaker. But sometimes it's, there's a point where you just have to do it. And I did it. Never heard again from him since, but yeah. And also, too, it's, what's interesting is, sorry, but I feel like there's a couple more things important to say here. Oh, there's a nice bird here. Look, the bird trained us. You see that bird? Birdie, birdie. So, um... Uh, yeah, so he also too, and this is something I will definitely not say on record. You know, I want to respect his private life, but but I just want to admit that there were some things he did which were really unethical. Like I, it was just clear on. Like if you would write it down on a piece of paper and you read, you read about it, you'd be like, holy crap, this is wrong. But then he would go out and show himself an ex as an example, and and especially to young guys, would pose himself as the guy who knows the answers better than everyone else and would, tr and, would, and would tutor them. He would tell exactly what they're doing wrong, what they should be doing right. It's dark stuff. It's dark stuff because it impacts that brain. It impacts that person's lives like it did to me. And I had to fight against that for years to kind of get out of it. And not to say, you know, like it doesn't affect me at all anymore, like with that tongue thing. And actually, I remember this, I think this will be the last thing, which is, again, an important part to acknowledge and recognize. Uh, how lack of critical thinking in an instructor can really damage you, not only psychologically, but also physically. Because uh, he was also all about hardcore training. He was a very, uh, he was a very uh, devoted kind of religious guy about Kyokushin karate. Which, if you don't know, that's a karate style created by Masutamu, uh, Masutatsu Ayama, a guy who lived in a forest for like half a year, just straining and breaking rocks with his bare hands. And he would fight bulls, actual bulls, with, with bare hands and cut off their horns with his hands. But, and, but, but he also created a style of karate called Kyokushin, which was really, I think it was unhealthy. It was full contact sparring, but they would break each other's bones and uh, do like ridiculously hard types of training, which I'm pretty sure it was it's damaging for the body, like hitting walls and everything. And I was inspired by that because that's what my keto instructor, my first keto instructor, he presented to me that as the as the way to go to. So I was hitting walls with my bare hands. My knuckles are still they're still deformed. Like these two knuckles, see how big they are. And, uh, and there's like, you know, I can feel like the bones are not right there. Sometimes it's still a bit painful because I thought that it's all about conditioning them, that that's the way to go. And uh, so, but also we did other, you know, crazy things. I would, I would tr inspired by him, I would try to do a split and I ignored all other uh, stretching exercises and I overstretched certain parts of my body which started to feel like 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 I would have I would have very strong tension in parts of my body and, and pain because I was always overstretching it in a wrong way and he was like he, he was suggesting that it's a good practice to do just just go nuts during your during a split um, he would also put us on top of each other like I would a guy of my size like 80 kilograms like 180 pounds would sit on my shoulders and we would do these Aikido turns, which are bad for the knees. And we would keep doing them. And eventually that led me to, years later, but it led me to my meniscus operation. My knee was, I had to have surgery because of that type of training. Because I fucked up my meniscuses. That's, I could tell you the science behind it, but it's clear that it comes from that shit. You know, and so there was so much hardcore training encouraged. And the, the crazy and almost ironically funny part is, uh, from what I know of him now, he's pretty much a cripple. He can, he can barely move, he can barely teach Aikido anymore. He, he uses his students to teach for him because, because of that type of training. He was abusing his body for years and he has multiple injuries. And he already was, had those injuries already when I was training with him. He, was, he kept having surgeries and it didn't occur to him that Maybe the way 
I'm, that his training is is fucked up and and he shouldn't shouldn't teach his students to do the same but he did he encouraged us to do it and so inspired by that i would continue to do crazy shit i would put on weights i would put on like five kilos on each leg four kilos on each arms and 10 kilo wet west and i would run and do exercises with it and, and these unhealthy aikido turns on full feet which are bad for the knees and when i was 19 when i moved to switzerland i was like an old man my knees were painful my knees are still painful till this day i have to really take care of my knees uh my back was my back muscles were too short i had constant back pain when i was nine, uh, 18 19 constantly i was having back pains hip pains shoulder pain till today i'm still actually recovering from that and on and yoga helped me I worked a lot. I do foam rolling and stuff to kind of get get my body back to balance. But those few years that I trained with him and I was encouraged to go hardcore, uh, I'm actually still suffering the, the implications from it. Till this day, you know, there's there's a significant impact from it. So, what's the moral here? My moral here is, I think it's pretty evident, it's pretty obvious. If you are a teacher, it's a huge, 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 huge responsibility. People will look up to you, most people will not question you, so that means you need to make sure they question you. You need to encourage that. You need to always, you need to question yourself even more than anyone else. You have to, if, if your students are already questioning you, you should question yourself even harder. I wish that my Aikido, my first Aikido instructor, would have been more intelligent and he would have looked at the science of stretching, of healthy training, of all that mystical bullshit that he taught us as reality, that he would have spent more time asking if it's the right thing to teach. He didn't, and I had to face a lot of shit because of that. And again, in a way, you know, in a way I can't even blame him. You know, he doesn't know what he doesn't know, but part of me wishes he did. Part of me does. So it's been a way longer video than I expected, but I felt it was important to put it on video. I know it's probably going to resonate with some of you, and there's a lot of valuable insights and lessons that I learned there which I feel will be valuable to you as well and if you are on the same page if you experienced at least something to such a degree or if you're an instructor a teacher then I'm pretty sure you know it was worth watching the whole thing anyway let me know what you think in the comments the journey continues and keep questioning <laughs>